Mental health issues have been in our family for a long time. My mother's mental illness was bipolar disorder, and it was pretty, um, it pretty much dominated our family life because she would go in and out of um, manic phases and depressive phases. She frequently would try to kill herself. Um, I have a sister who's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, and then I have a brother who has episodic depression. Um, now, many years later, uh, I would talk to a famous bipolar psychiatrist, and when I relayed my family history to him, he said, oh, no, it's your father I'm really interested in. I'm like, really? And uh, he gave me his reasons why, because I used to talk about rage attacks that my father would have. I remember being five years old and um, having uh, having these crying spells for no reason at all. After my mom died, I found that I was experiencing a depression unlike any depression I had ever experienced before. It had a different quality to it. There was a kind of an automation to it. Uh, you know, when you go to the airport, you stand on those moving walkways, and you're just standing there, and it's like you're moving through life. I was moving towards suicide, and I didn't have to do anything. It's like there was an automatic biological process underway that had nothing to do with my wants or desires. Something deep in me said, I need help. I don't think I can manage this one. So I came in, was seen by a psychiatrist. He gave me an antidepressant that night. Well, he returned 12 hours later, and I was just giggly as ever. I mean, I was Tigger. <laughs> I went from being Eeyore to Tigger in 12 hours. I didn't have the knowledge to know that the fact that my doctor saw this dramatic change in a 12-hour period was fortuitous because at that point the doctor said, hmm, Maybe we ought to be thinking about bipolar here. I made the personal decision that in light of the suffering that is entailed in this disease, I could not knowingly and willingly impart or even risk imparting this degree of suffering on another human being. I could not ever in good conscience you know, pass this on. And so I made the decision a long time ago I would never reproduce. I'm thinking about a particular veteran that I have spent a lot of time um, supporting as a, in a peer support capacity for the last year. This particular veteran got diagnosed with bipolar disorder and discharged from the military because of that diagnosis. He didn't want to accept the diagnosis. He was convinced that it was wrong. Well, I knew from interacting with him over months and watching him cycle through these ups and downs, I knew he was bipolar. But the question is, how could I get him to see what was so obvious to clinicians and me as a peer? The more nitty gritty I started getting into with him about his mother's behavioral history, the more it became apparent to me that she was textbook bipolar. And I said, uh, would you like to do a, something I'm calling bipolar book club with me? He says, what's that? I said, well, you know, it's just kind of a, you know, we talk about bipolar and do some readings every week, maybe bring in another person, you know, a little club, book club. We'll just focus on bipolar. He said, oh, well, I guess so. It sounds, sounds like a good idea. Sure. So um, we spent three months meeting once a week on the telephone. We had bipolar book club, and there were three of us, and we were all bipolar. And we read a psychiatry textbook on bipolar. And I, I noticed many years ago, when I was in a really de depressive, suicidal kind of state, that if I read a chapter on suicide research, it put me in a mindset where it made the acuteness of it seem less. Because by reading a chapter on suicide research, I realized that everything I was experienced, experiencing was stereotypic. It was textbook. It wasn't unique. It wasn't me, my quirks, my eccentricities, my person. No. <laughs> it's stereotypic bipolar. 
And in a way, I found relief in that because it gave me a sense of, hey, this isn't personal. It's not because I'm a jerk or, you know, I'm a, a mean person or just don't have a nice personality. This is the luck of the draw. This is genetics. This is what I've got. And there are some fancy researchers out there who totally get it. And they've actually pinned us down in predictable ways using legitimate scientific methodology. And I thought, this is liberating. If I could show this to other mental health consumers, then maybe they can accept this disease more readily. So that's what we did with this veteran. At the end of three months, I kind of did a little exit interview with him, and I said, so, do you think you have bipolar? He said, oh, <laughs> do I ever have bipolar? He said, Joan, I get it now. I really didn't understand the illness. I mean, what I've learned in the last three months is that there's a whole science behind this. There's a lot of genetic knowledge and I didn't know that. Now I know that. Now I understand a little bit about how that research is done. And I realized, you know, this is real and I just have to face it. So I think that learning about the science of your diagnosis is a very healthy thing to do because you do get to understand that it's not just some guy with a hat that says psychiatrist who wants to push pills on you because a rep was there the other day and she was really pretty. But seriously, this, this bit of self-education has to be, I think, the primary uh, way for one to successfully address these illnesses. And um, I think it's great that we have science to turn to to show us that we may not know what gene or genes are causing bipolar disorder, but we know enough to know that there is genetic machinery that is driving this train. And if you don't do something about it, we're driving off the cliff.